Hi everybody, I'm Antonio Diaz. I'm the founder of Life in Time and thank you so much for attending our third, third, third webinar. Um, and we've been just having like such a great time on, on producing these. We've got many more coming up. We have one coming up on Friday and then another one next week. Um, and for today's webinar, we're gonna be focused on storytelling in times of crisis. And this is a rare opportunity where we are actually going to be talking to our correspondents or journalists and photographers um, about how they're adapting to this uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, we usually are uh, uh, telling the stories of others of how they're adapting. So this is kind of a cool opportunity. I'm really excited to um, dive into this conversation about how uh, journalism and media is adapting. And um, our moderator and host is my good friend, Nicole Ziza Bauer, who is one of our correspondents here in Los Angeles. And I'm gonna have her take it away. All right, Ziza. Thanks, Antonio. Hello, everybody. I'm Ziza. Um, like Antonio said, I'm a writer and also a correspondent here with Life and Time. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I'm sure, like many people, I'm both a creator and a consumer of media and I'm constantly wondering how do I do that wisely and responsibly? Um, because we crave stories. We love stories. They're how we connect and um, share things with one another and find meaning and purpose, especially when our world feels a bit upended. Um, so I will introduce our guests who are all incredible women. Um, we have Elena Valeriet, who is in Tuscany, Italy. She's also a writer here with Life and Time. We have Izzy Croker, who is in London, a food stylist and a photographer, and also Allison Zuka, who is a photographer based here in Los Angeles. So um, we will get started. I think a great place to start initially when we're having a conversation about um, storytelling in the media is one, is the media reliable? How do we approach that to start with? Um, what are the sources that we can take seriously? How do we go about that in today's climate? It's very easy to silo ourselves into different perspectives and schools of thought. So Elena, I would love to start with you. Um, being in Italy, which is one of the ground zeros of this pandemic, I would love to know what your experience has been like with the media, if you've seen it sort of as a lifeline or as a hindrance um, in this time, and also if anything moving forward for you will change how you view the news or interact with it. Yeah, so I actually feel that I had a very interesting experience with the media coming in because I, I'm from California, but I do live in Italy and I was home for the winter holidays and just got back to Italy at the start of February when things were really just taking off here, unfortunately. And uh, so I experienced the pandemic sort of through both Italian media and American media because I'm tied between the two. Um, and it was very interesting for me to see how the different countries portrayed uh, sort of the outbreak uh, during during the event uh, as it was un unfolding. Because in the states, I found that a lot of the media about Italy really, you know, kept saying Italy is the epicenter, um, and it was quite depressing the news that was coming out of here. And of course, it was a devastating situation. But my experience of it was very different in Italy because I felt that we were getting a lot more hopeful stories um, and not necessarily from big publications, but I, through you know WhatsApp and through social media, was just constantly finding examples of really positive uh, community building efforts and you know people playing music and turning on the lights and clapping and having virtual aperitivo and you know finding ways to connect throughout, um, which I thought was really beautiful and I kept wanting for those stories to find their way to the States. And I think they did eventually make their way over there. Um, but it was a little bit you know, overwhelming at first because there's a nine hour difference between Italy and California. And so I would wake up in the morning with <laughs> dozens of texts from people in the States that were completely terrified of what was going on and asking me if I was okay, which of course came from a place of kindness and concern, um, but I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that how the Italians were facing things and that they were acting with resilience and solidarity um, and that I did see things, you know, that, that gave me hope for the situation. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the future, does that change 
you know, maybe if you see a news story, considering the source and then maybe finding, you know, one from that country to kind of balance it out. Do you have any suggestions or how things will change in the future? Yeah, definitely. I think it's really important for people to seek out uh, news from the country where that event is unfolding um, to get their perspective on it and to, you know, reach out to people that are experiencing it firsthand um, and also to look for the positive in news. I mean, not in any way to diminish the devastation that's occurring, but to we have to find hope to find a way forward. Um, so we need to look for meaningful meaningful opportunities in all of this. And I think that does come from some of the, the voices that are deep in it um, through social media and through not necessarily big publications that are kind of looking for striking headlines. Absolutely. And Allison, I wanna jump to you because as a photographer, you are a creator for a lot of the mainstream news sources that specifically Americans look to, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. I would love to know as a photographer, can you share a little bit, maybe for those of us who don't know, what the workflow looks like when you are given an assignment, when you go out sourcing a story, and um, yeah, if anything has ever been taken out of context, I'm sure we also know when viral photos go around and considering those sources, has that you know ever happened to you where a photo has been used in a way maybe you didn't agree with? Um, well, just sort of talking about the workflow, that's definitely changed. Um, you know, a lot of my workflow before was a lot of pitching ideas, pitching stories with people that I, you know, I know in Los Angeles, things that are happening. Um, and then I usually actually photograph a bit of the story first and then I pitch it. So now I'm not doing any of that. Um, just because I'm only going to go out and photograph something if I'm on assignment to just reduce risk. Um, so now I'll just pitch ideas and have conversations with editors about what they're looking for and what they, you know, like in the beginning, I feel like it was a lot of, or at least things that I got assigned were a lot of like the restaurant closures and things like that. And then now, you know, it's a bit changing, even though, um, you know, restaurants are still impacted and changing every day. Um, so that's definitely changed. Um, and in terms of the workflow, I mean, it's definitely for me a bit slower. Um, than it used to be, obviously. Um, but in terms of viral photos, like that's never happened to me where anything's kind of gotten taken out of context. Um, but when I just think of a viral photo right away, I think of like John Moore's 2018 photo of the, um, the little migrant girl and how that kind of just blasted that issue into our, all, like, all of our lives, which I think was really important. Um, but yeah, what was the question about? The viral photos and things like just that. Just as a photographer, just to kind of give credit to your work as a photographer, I think a lot of people can have fear or mistrust around new sources or images that are pervaded. And so just as a photographer for you, um, that sense of ownership, like you trust when you hand over those photos, that's shared in, in integrity and honesty. Yeah, definitely. I feel like it's all about conversations. So conversations when I'm out covering anything now, you know, people are nervous, like even covering, I was covering Super Tuesday with the elections and the ener there was a lot of energy and nervous energy and you know people were nervous about having their photos taken and I think especially in sensitive times like it's all the time that you're sensitive towards people you have conversations if they don't want to be photographed it's like absolutely I totally understand um so then there's those conversations and just taking the time to like understand where people are at and if they express any concerns relaying those concerns to editors and there's been times where you know I was covering a story around um uh, hotels opening up for homeless individuals in Los Angeles and so you know that was a very slow process of talking with the people running that and the you know public relations team there to make sure what was okay what was not okay and then um you know if there was something captured that wasn't okay then I I'm respecting that and then not not submitting that. Yeah. And then that's kind of an interesting follow-up question. How do you decide when you take an image or if you're working on a story, maybe you've caught something or you've uncovered something that needs to stay private versus, oh, wow, like remaining neutral and thinking I should share this. This is important. How do you weigh that, um, that decision? I would say if it's like, I, like the goal is to never like bring someone harm or anything like that. Um, so I think just evaluating, you know, 
is it part of the story? If it's not, then is it needed? Um, I remember I was covering a hospital the other week and there was a guy I was across the street from, you know, EMTs. I would never show like faces of victims unless they signed off because that's not the story. And that's, you know, why that's not it. It's not about their story. Um, and you don't want to further victimize people that are going to the hospital. But so, so EMTs are bringing in this guy into the hospital. You couldn't see the guy on the stretcher, but the guy who stepped out of the door and was doing the temperature for the EMTs, he had a mask. He, he wasn't wearing his mask. And so I was like, well, that's kind of doesn't make that put them in a very good light. So I just then did send that to my editor because that is also what's happening. Um, and it was in public and it was in a public space. So I just sent it to my editor. I let her know, like, this, just keep an eye out for this and like have a conversation around it. Um, but yeah, so, so kind of just keep a balance with check, checking in of, you know, is this about the story or is it not? And is there no need to put it in? Yeah. And Elena, I would love you to jump into as a writer, because there's, it's kind of that same question when you're either interviewing someone or sourcing a story, do you find a need to balance like, oh, should I put this in the story or wow, this is a personal moment. This should stay, stay private. For me, I mostly write about people in relation to food. And so I don't find that there are a lot of instances where there's something that they wouldn't go, that they wouldn't want to be public. Um, if there is, usually they make a side comment saying, don't put that information in there. Um, so I don't have to make a lot of huge decisions usually around that. But I generally find that, yeah, you have to, like Allison was saying, see its value within the arc of the story as a whole. So I like to go behind the scenes in a lot of my things. And I think even if something's a little bit uncomfortable or, you know, difficult, people need to understand, especially when it comes to the food system, food system how people are struggling or what are some things that they should be aware of. Great. And speaking of food, um, I would also love to look at the concept of food media, which I think in U.S. media is a big deal. It can kind of be a bubble at times. And so specifically, Izzy and then Elena to follow up, what does food media look like in the U.K.? Is it different? Is it respected? I'd love some perspective on that. Well, I mean, I think it's definitely respected in the U.K. It's a I mean, I can only speak from my experience and I consume a lot of food media. So for me, it's a big part of my everyday life as well, because I don't just consume it, but I work on the other side and I help create it. So um, I think that my consumption of food media is probably quite niche. And I think that's obviously different. So sort of when we work editorially, I think there's a real kind of feeling within our industry that we're trying to be sort of authentic. And so on editorial food shoots, we don't sort of coat things in boot polish and everything is edible on the shoot. We really work to minimize our waste at the end of the day. We use apps that uh, if things haven't been opened and they're safe to go to the local community, they can go to charities and, you know, help. Um, and then we really try and, you know, not, we all take stuff home. We try not to throw things away. So I think that on that side of things, there's definitely um, the feeling of wanting to get across like honest stories and an honest portrayal of, of food. Um, but obviously in the mass media and sort of more advertising, that's harder to uh, sort of manage because, you know, when it's, the big Christmas campaigns and, you know, they're not going to declare that it's the fifth, the, the turkey up on the billboard is the 15th turkey and all the others have gone in the bin because the regulations are really strict. So, you know, I think there's a spectrum of truth and uh, I am always trying to work, you know, on the truthful side. Um, and then I think obviously a lot of food media is consumed on Instagram and that's definitely sort of trickier water because we're sort of navigating a lot of, you know, influencer culture, which isn't necessarily wholly truthful. And how do you sort of se like separate that from the stories that are? So I think what is good is being able to curate your own um, source of media as well. Um, so, yeah. Great. Elena, any thoughts? Yeah, so I, my experience of Italian food media is very different from American food media. I think Italians are a lot more interested in consuming the food itself than consuming media about the food. Um, and I think it comes down to very big difference in cultures. Uh, Italian food culture really 
finds what's best is what's traditional um, in a lot of ways, rather than American culture, which values what's new is best. Um, and it's very, American food media is more focused on trends. Um, and I think Italian food media tends to gear towards celebration of, you know, of, of classic recipes and traditions in the kitchen. Um, and the food celebrities here are, you know, the known ones, the grandmas, the ones who are carrying on these traditions. Um, there are exceptions, of course, to that. There's Massimo Butura, who came into fame after his appearance on Chef's Table and has been really the star of the, the pandemic um, in terms of Italy with his hashtag Gin Quarantine video series. His Instagram is amazing. If anyone hasn't watched it, he's extremely passionate and goes back and forth between Italian and English in a truly joyful way, uh, cooking in his home kitchen with his family. Um, and so, yeah, there's also just so many uh, Italian customs that are really strong. I think a lot of foreigners might see them as strict rules um, that aren't necessarily fun, how Italians feel about food spaces. Um, they're not as open to people taking pictures of their food and sort of doing what they see as strange things that might interrupt the actual eating experience. Um, so I think that's partly why it's, it's a very, very different way of uh, approach. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and speaking of food, Izzy, I want to come back to you because, you know, obviously your work, as you said, is very food centered up until the pandemic. There's a lot of travel involved, restaurants, very collaborative and communal. And we'll get into your book in a minute that has come out of this time. But just first, also just to kind of address what I'm sure also a lot of people are dealing with is you probably had a lot of uh, lost jobs and canceled projects or shelved projects during this time. And I would love to know how you've walked through that. Um, and also Allison and Elena, if you want to jump in, feel free. But Izzy, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think, um, well, I think here in the UK, we had a sort of delayed reaction. So it took quite a while for all our jobs to sort of be canceled because there was still this sort of feeling of, uh, I think we sort of, as you all can probably tell, pushed it a bit far and we should have locked down sooner. But so I was still getting jobs kind of coming in the week before lockdown. I think photographers were starting, you know, people were starting to cancel work and um, everyone was very understanding of that. But because our guidelines weren't very clear, we were, there were also photographers who were still working. So publications were just trying to figure out who, who could work on their own, who could still work with sort of skeleton teams. Um, but then when we went sort of, we had our official lockdown, um, everything got canceled. And I think sort of the one benefit of being a freelancer um, is that, I mean, I'm sure you guys get this as well, but you have periods where you're working a lot and then you have quieter periods. So sort of the first three weeks, I, I was sort of feeling okay. I didn't feel too stressed because I think I'd sort of, you know, I've had months or like, you know, times when I'm not working and I sort of prepared for that. Um, but then sort of the longer it got extended, it sort of became more, um, there was more fear, you're, you're uncertain, you don't know when you're next earning money. Um, and also you just feel sad because you're in the middle of uh, really exciting projects with people and, you know, you don't know who's going to come out the other side wanting to carry them on or, um, and especially as a travel photographer as well, that's really uncertain. You know, I have, um, I'm teaching a workshop in Greece in September and we still don't know, even though Greece are um, opening their borders again, uh, if we have to quarantine for two weeks when we come back to the UK, it's going to make things very hard for us uh, work-wise and travel-wise. So, um, it's just a lot of uncertainty, really. And that's that's the sort of strangest thing, because I think um, you're obviously the more uncertain. Everything. It's already everything is so sort of upside down as it is. So just to have even more uncertainty added on to that, it's pretty stressful. Uh, Alison, I know you mentioned that beforehand you were doing a lot of pitching and now it's more assignment. How how have you worked through that? process was that an easy switch was that just kind of a pivot adapt quick jump in what's it been like I would say my similar my experience was pretty similar to Izzy's in the sense that like in the beginning I was like I've I know how to do this like I've been training for this for years like it wasn't hard to work from home not be as busy I was I you know worked on marketing and I work on my newsletter and I work on you know 
accounting, as boring as that is, you know, I was having other things that I needed to do. And then it was like about probably two months in that I was like, okay, like I, my fatigue, my, you know, slight fatigue started setting in. Um, and I know a lot of friends that haven't had any assignments, so I'm, I've been really lucky to have some assignment work. Um, but it, it felt like it was like all compact into like one day a week or a few days a week where it was like, I have an assignment, it's a really busy day. And then like the rest of the days are just like nothing. Um, and so I think when that started happening, like the fatigue, I took a bit of time to like work on things like food, you know, food's really important to us. And so cooking and like we started making pasta kits for people like our friends in Los Angeles and like just dropping them off at their houses. And um, so that was like just a good outlet that wasn't photography focused to just give me kind of like a mental break of that pressure that I think we all put on ourselves to create. Um, and so then now, and I've been working on a collaborative project um, called, it's called The Journal, but it's with uh, women photographs. And, um, and so that was cool to be able to have this group and we were all creating in different parts of the world, but there wasn't any sense of real pressure to make something. Um, so if you felt like it, great, you can submit things and um, do that. But if you, you know, if you're having like a tough day, you don't have to make anything at all. Um, so I would say it's the same, but um, going forward, I think I'm still just trying to keep my ear, you know, to the ground, hear what people are communicating. Like if there is a story, you know, I'm, I'm still having conversations around this. There's different stories and talking to editors about it, but it's just a bit more um, less in-person background work and more phone calls, videos, chats, things like that. Elena, as a writer and writing in this time, has it, you know, did you have to deal with any change in focus or projects you're working on, grief to let them go, anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I did lose a couple projects at the beginning of this um, just because either budgets dried up or there's uncertainty. Um, the tourism industry was closed down, travel wasn't allowed, so I simply couldn't get there. Um, so there's a little bit of a time to have to adjust to all of that. Um, but you know, luckily I've had sort of the opposite option, which is, you know, like we've been talking about things come in waves. Um, you have quiet periods and then busy periods, and this has been an especially busy period for me, um, which is very fortunate. At times difficult though, because a lot of people do call me at all hours of the day now that everyone's working from home and ask me how I'm passing the time, how I'm keeping busy, <laughs> and I'm having no trouble <laughs> passing the time. There seems to be not enough time ever. Um, but I'm lucky to have a lot of projects going on that are continuing independent of the circumstances because they were, you know, for the past five years, basically, I've worked entirely remotely most of the time. Um, so I've been prepared for this and had things that were still streaming in. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, like Allison, I pitched things out and um, my focus has shifted a bit. But I, you know, even before this, I had been really working to go towards more serious food writing on the topics of farming and food supply chains. And now more than ever, that is extremely essential. Um, and so, you know, we talk a lot about essential work. And I think I've been kind of working towards an essential writing style for me, what's what I think it needs to be told at this moment. Um, and so I have been, you know, making, making those changes. Um, and things kind of just you know, whereas I might have been going out to find a story before, now I might go into the kitchen and just stare into my pantry for a while and something <laughs> pop up. So. Perfect. And we will definitely get back to some of the things you, you said. Um, and I want to jump back over to Izzy now and talk about staying in because you actually created a book, a beautiful digital cookbook in quarantine, and it's benefiting chefs and schools in the UK. And I would love to know how that collaboration came about to connect, you know, your creative powers and this tangible need, um, how you recognize your role to play in this time with the skills that you have? Well, um, it sort of came about because I, I think I had hit, I sort of went through a bit of a lockdown isolation journey and sort of the first couple of weeks felt like I was thriving and sort of doing all these really sort of, you know, I sort of say that it's kind of like nauseatingly whimsical things, you know, like why, why am I suddenly embroidering? I've never embroidered before. 
Um, and then that lasted for about sort of two weeks. And then I started sort of feeling just a bit lost. And um, Meg Abbott, who's sort of my, um, or she's my best friend and my sort of writing half to my photography. And um, she kept sort of saying to me, like, do a photography project. And she'd sort of text me every day going, how's it going? And I just sort of was in denial kind of, because I'm, I'm a very keen home cook, but I'm not a recipe writer and I'm a, I'm a temporary food stylist, but food photography is sort of my, is my bread and butter. Um, so I, yeah, she just, I felt like I didn't know, I didn't have a voice to, to sort of cook things and share them. So then it sort of, I started asking the friends that I've sort of made within the food industry whether they'd be happy with me shooting and sharing their recipes. And I just was overwhelmed with the response of them. And I sort of knew that I wanted to be a, it to be a charity project because I think I was feeling quite helpless. You know, I, I have a very, I'm in a very creative industry that's sort of quite niche. And, you know, how do I translate food photography into something that is going to benefit somebody tangibly? And that... Um, was something I was kind of struggling with. I wanted to help, but I didn't know how. Um, and so this sort of book just became this idea and Chefs in School was a really natural fit because um, Nicole Pisani, who used to be head chef at one of Ottolenghi's restaurants, Nopi, left to set up this charity where they basically retrain chefs on the ground the people are working in schools as if they're sort of uh, running professional kitchens so the idea is to educate children in schools about the food um, improve the quality of the food as well and um, in the UK uh, 1.3 million children are eligible for free school meals so during lockdown they can't get those school meals so the charity sort of pivoted and they're providing these boxes that get sent to vulnerable families and children of key workers and it feeds them for an entire week so it just felt like a really nice link and Nicole styled the first cookbook I ever shot sort of six years ago and we've shot five cookbooks together since so it was, there was just a lot of nice links between the book and the charity and it also felt really nice that sort of something that people could buy to do with food, to do with staying in, was going to benefit children who were staying in and weren't benefiting from being made to stay in. Um, and I think just sort of the fact that um, we've raised £30,000 now, and that is 24,000 meals made and delivered. So it's a really, you know, tangible thing that is being created. And that just is such an amazing feeling. Absolutely. And I think too, I mean, that's probably, I would say, and you can comment more on this, but thinking about being creative moving forward, you know, maybe there's opportunities that have dried up, but also there's so many more opportunities where, you know, practical needs and maybe other industries that didn't previously use creative sources as much creatives can kind of step in and help bridge, bridge the need with the skill. Definitely. I think that, one of the benefits and the good things that hopefully will come out of this is just sort of new relationships and sort of ideas that um, weren't there before. You know, people have more time to think about where they can place their sort of skills in a way that's going to benefit communities around them. Um, and I think that, you know, I I don't think I would have created this book um, had it not you know I know it's a very specific book to isolation but I think it's I wouldn't have created something like it without being on my own and it was really difficult in so many ways but I think the the satisfaction as well of creating something and sort of being so outside my comfort zone um because I I read I never shoot on my own I'm always in a team whether it's with the food stylist my assistant, their assistant, um, art directors, creative directors, you know, to be completely on my own, just marching to the beat of my own drum, shooting stuff just for the, you know, and really making sure, you know, just shooting stuff that it was what I wanted to shoot as well. I didn't have anyone telling me, oh, you know, do this and do that, which was freeing as, you know, but at the start, I definitely sort of was questioning myself. But I think that, um, 
yeah sorry I think I went off on a massive tangent there but I agree <laughs> is my main point <laughs> totally fine um Allison I wanted to jump back to you did you want to yeah talk- I was um thinking about it in terms of when Elena was talking about pitches and stories changing or getting you know shifted there's definitely like a slew of stories that were non-COVID related that you know got shelved when everything happened um and I've definitely found like pitches like right now you can't really pitch anything that's not COVID related um and and it's starting to shift a little bit you know some stories are coming out that don't have it you know as the main focal point um so I think in the beginning it was like anything that's non you know, pandemic related isn't getting put out there, um, at least from my experience. And then, you know, now we're kind of like finding our way back, like this is going to be in our lives for, you know, a very long time. So I think people are starting to, you know, a bit normalize with that. Um, And in terms of like, like the creative new opportunities, I definitely as much as like, you know, there's people that I've come in contact with, like out just covering different things who have been nervous or like are going through a lot right now um, and don't want to share their stories. There's been so many people that because we all all are going through this thing, that connection, like when they wanted to talk was really, you know, quick, very, like very quickly, they wanted to kind of open up and share. Um, And I think that's been really beautiful. I remember the first night that the restaurant closed in Los Angeles, I was um, covering Nancy Silverton's, you know, food operation when they were feeding restaurant workers and my husband works in a restaurant and so it felt so good to be around other people that were experiencing kind of the same thing that my family was experiencing um so I think that camaraderie in terms of storytelling and listening and sharing has been invaluable mm-hmm. absolutely and that's you know to an extent what the media should be what we should be you know cluing in and listening and thinking about those um those connection points that we all have and that bring the meat to a good story. Um, so that said, to kind of loop back to something we've touched on briefly, but thinking about this pandemic and how certain industries, and um, we've mentioned it with food and, um, you know, influencers, I think Izzy, you mentioned, but just more about, do you, I can go to Izzy first, um, feel that in light of the pandemic, what's coming out of this is kind of going to trim the fat in some senses in terms of what, is going to get produced, what's going to be shared, um, maybe for the creative to think again about what do I really have to offer and what does that look like to partner with other other organizations, other programs? Do you have any thoughts on that kind of being in it yourself? I, I think that it is going to make people really think about sort of the next steps. And in terms of I mean, more in practical terms, I think it's going to change the way that we shoot and sort of um, we're going to really sort of, I mean, you were talking about trimming the fat in a different sense, but I think in terms of shooting itself, we're going to have to learn how to operate on much smaller scales as well. Um, And with that comes a lot of challenges of sort of shooting in studios and the sort of travel thing. So I think that yeah, I think that there's no way that you can come out of this without a different outlook on it. But I think it's still so early in that stage. You know, I only just um, did a first shoot this week and it was on such a small scale um, that I don't quite know yet what that sort of how that's going to play out in the next couple of months. But I think that I just don't see a way that it's going to be able to go back to sort of how we were shooting and sort of producing content before. Um, and Elena, to come back to you and what you were talking about in terms of storytelling and the types of stories you tell, specifically the stories that you told, as at least for Life and Time, have been, you know, these deeper issues like the extinction or tariffs and how they'll affect small businesses. These stories that really reveal maybe everyday things we take for granted, but are very fragile and it takes a crisis or it takes intense pressure to reveal the fragility of those systems. How have you approached maybe thinking about the stories you're gonna tell in the future? And you know, maybe does that mean you look like writing less because the stories have more impact versus writing a lot and you know, being a sustainable freelance writer, if that exists. Um, but yeah, I would love your, your thoughts on, on how your writing is evolving. 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely want to be focusing more on like, like we were talking about some of the stories that I've been working on this year, which are looking at the different parts of the food system. I've always been fascinated by what's kind of going on behind the scenes. I think that before COVID, um, a lot of food stories were focused on sort of the last chapter of the food story, which is, you know, the food on its plate in front of you and you're the protagonist and it's the experience of the story is what how you're enjoying the food. And what I've always been interested in and I think is sort of the shift that's going on now and definitely my path forward is um, the story, the chapters before that. Um, so I think there's this whole long journey that the food takes to get to us. Um, and I don't mean just the journey in terms of, you know, those like food miles, which can be very daunting, you know, how, how long the banana um, got on a plane to get to you, which is also interesting and, you know, necessary, but not necessarily the most effective for, for a really engaging story. Um, I think the journey has to be sort of all the characters that are involved in the story. So what I want to be writing about and what I think people need to hear is, you know, who's growing the food and who's moving the food, who's processing it and preparing it and delivering it to you. Um, and I think that, you know, we need to be writing about the people that are in it, um, kind of a shift away, you know, from the, the restaurant owners and the chefs towards the servers and the farmers and the grocery workers. And, you know, we want the people that are in it. Um, and so that's definitely what I'm going to be looking at. As far as photos, Allison, is that change, I guess, how you take photos or you source the photos for different stories, thinking about maybe what goes into those really memorable um, emotion driven photos that we can look to, especially in, in times of crisis to kind of say what words can't. Um, what does your process look like in terms of sourcing images or taking images? Yeah, I think it, it definitely obviously changes. Everything's changed. But um, the distance thing, obviously, like, is a bit of a barrier and masks and all the protect, you know, PPE that we have to wear um, and that people are wearing. It's hard to convey the emotion that people are going through. Um, so that's definitely been something that, like, has been a challenge. But working through that, I think sometimes that even calls for more prep than ever, like beforehand in terms of finding out, um, you know, who are the exact people that we're telling the story of and like, what is their life schedule looking like? Who are the people in their lives? Like I do a lot. I've already done that a lot of questions before I get to a shoot. It's not just like this is the person and, you know, it's like, who do they live with? What's happening in their life? Because those little details will reveal what's emotional for them. Um, you know, I just did a portrait last week and it was, of a CEO and like their, their company and their, how it's changing and things like that. But also he just had a three week year old. Um, and so that adds a whole nother element of emotion to his life and things that are impacting him. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm shooting with a longer lens normally now, um, just to try and get into like people's emotions in their eyes. And, um, I think also trying to work really fast. I was, uh, when I had a cover in a hospital, I only had an hour and it was really intense and I'm trying to work through my PPE. And so that's making it, it really challenging to try and just stay calm and focus on the emotions. Um, and so I think I was doing a dance of trying to work really fast and like really, really tap into the expressions and um, how people were like leaning on each other or just like, you know, their body language but also kind of work fast and slow in the kind of a, a dance. Um, so I think for me, the best thing is just the prep work before to try and find out as much information as I can so that I can, when those moments happen, you know, if there is a moment be between two people, I know that I already know that there's a relationship there and that I should be paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think makes a good photograph? Just a simple question. Um, <laughs> I think you can really tell for me, I'm, I'm a people photographer, so I'm people all day, every day. I'm, and you can tell when someone's really listening or like really taking the time to pay attention to the subject or the person that's in the photo. Um, I think the stronger photos, like strong photos come from lots of listening beforehand. Um, Izzy, I want to ask the same question to you. What makes what makes a great photograph? Well, 
it's I think it's very different when it sort of comes to food um, because there can obviously be emotion in food but it's you know less emotion than if you're sort of shooting somebody and you've listened to their story and so I think when it comes to food you know there are so many elements that make a good photo and it can be beautiful light it can be composition Um, but I think that especially when you're sort of shooting less studio-led food and you're shooting on location or um, you know travel pieces and you're in restaurants I think uh, it's it's got a similar thing. It's conveying some kind of emotion um, in the in the photo, and often that's to do with atmosphere. But I think that what is amazing about sort of food um, journalism and photography and the way that they work together is that sort of the writing that surrounds food and often accompanies food images can just enhance the image so much. You know, you can be looking at a really beautiful photo of you know, uh, a corner of an Italian, you know, restaurant with a beautiful, and like the light's beautiful. But if you can read the story behind that and sort of what took you to that um, place and why it's special, I think that just only helps make it a better photo as well. Absolutely. Um, And Ellen, I want to come back to you with this question and I would love um, if Izzy and Alison also want to jump in because you're all in different in different um, parts of the world. But I, Ellen, I would love to know, you know, seeing how we're all in this big global pandemic, the importance you feel, you know, being an American, but living in Italy, the importance of seeing how other countries respond to a shared collective experience. That's something pretty unique about this pandemic is that globally we are experiencing this thing and yet individually and specifically that can look very different. And so the importance you see and have seen and, believe in of the diversity of sharing on collective experiences. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that, you know, storytelling right now is of the utmost importance and that it's the way that we're connecting with other people. Um, And the stories need to make us feel connected. And the, the way they're being told in different countries is certainly useful also to the extent that, you know, Italy, for example, is, sort of said to be a month ahead of the states um, in the way this is sort of rolling out. Um, So they can look to us to see how we've acted and sort of decide whether or not that that might work for them. Um, And that can work on, you know, on a, on a national scale or it can work on the individual scale or a business level, you know, they can see that maybe an Italian farmer started a CSA box and that was the way that they kept their business going or that a restaurant pivoted to grocery and that's how they kept afloat. Um, and I think that that's really helpful because we have to, you know, the the big uh, advantage of this terrible thing happening to us all at once in this very moment is that we have the technology to be constantly in touch with each other and learn from each other's mistakes or struggles. Um, so that's that's what we've got to be doing right now. And and also, you know, from the perspective of being connected, um, food media in particular is essential in showing people that, you know, even if you're eating alone and you're just in your house and you're cooking out of your pantry, the food decisions you're making affect everyone. And so, you know, the way we saw in the States with the, um, the food supply chain disruption where there was no flour or there are other ingredients, you know, shortages, people have to think, you know, I, my actions have consequences. And when it comes to being, you know, food, you have to be so mindful that, every decision you make, it just seems like your breakfast, but it has an impact on people and animals and plants and the whole earth. So, you know, food media has the ability to show us, you know, the power we have to make a positive change, even just at home. Yeah, that's great. Um, Izzy or Allison, any other, any thoughts on that? Just from a photography perspective? I mean, I think Elena, just put that perfectly. I think also going back to sort of what she was talking about right at the start about the stories of hope. And I think that's a really important thing coming out of sort of global sharing of information because it, especially, you know, we, we're behind um, a lot of countries as well. So it's really important for us to be able to see that there, you know, is light at the end of the tunnel and also yeah and just the learning element as well you know we obviously had a really um 
shocking sort of reaction in all our supermarkets you know you'd go and the shelves would just be completely wiped and you'd see you know one of the images that went viral here which I'm not sure if um, you guys saw was of an old man just standing in these empty supermarket aisles because they'd just been completely wiped so I think um, again it's learning and it's um, you know that didn't happen in every country and it didn't have to happen in the UK so I think uh, yeah what Elena was saying just the sharing the learning um, just knowing that you what you're doing in your country isn't sort of the way that it has to be done you you can behave in other ways um is sort of what i take from it yeah i would just ag agree with all of that um i the thing that stuck out to me was just like my own personal life i haven't you know shopped at any of the grocery stores since this all started because i think there's this graciousness that everyone's trying to help everyone and there's this or you know a lot of people are um but in terms of supporting the local shops, supporting, you know, your neighbors in their shops or whatever their business is, um, and not going to your normal grocery store, we kind of ended up now just going to specialty stores. So it's the butcher and it's the, you know, the Russian market on my corner and things like that for our necessities. Um, and I think terms and photographing that, it's just, you can photograph and now like what's the changing story? So the story isn't necessarily the empty shelves anymore. It might be now it's changing to, you know, the shopping at the local stores or, you know, what does that look like? Um, Cause you still might go into Target and you still might find some empty shelves, but you know, they're being restocked every week. And, and so um, I think it's in terms of photographing that and just making sure that we're reporting on what's happening each day as it changes. Great. We're going to jump to some questions now. Yeah, so we've got a few questions here from the audience. Um, and if anybody wants to chime in, any last minute questions, feel free to put it in the, in the YouTube chat. Um, but here's, here's a question for, for writers and Ziza, feel free to also answer this one since you're also one of our correspondents. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, but how can you write in a way that will open people's eyes about the politics and social economics of food to show its failures and problems and what must be changed? Do you feel like you're walking a fine line or is it your responsibility simply to show the reality without really thinking about angering people and driving them apart? This is from Marie. Sure, I can just, I can jump in. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a fine line. Uh, but I don't know, I feel like the way to do it is always just through the, the human aspect. You don't want to be you want my goal, at least as a writer is always to educate people not to preach to people and to show them, you know, in a way that's going to make them empathize and feel uh, connected to the issue at hand. And when it comes to the food system, I think the way to do that is through the people to, to get them to, you know, think about the farmers and the people behind the scenes um, and definitely not hide how difficult everything is. I mean, people have to realize how fragile the food system is, uh, food system is. And I think right now what's really great that it's coming to light, you know, is that people aren't just saying everything's okay. You know, you know people are starting to say the margins are razor thin for farmers, for restaurants, for grocery. Um, and that we gotta be aware of these things so that we don't take them for granted anymore. Um, and then we understand that there is injustice in the food system and that the, the change is going to be hard for everyone, um, but then it needs to be made. Yeah, that's great. The only thing I would add would also just to say that importance of really researching and understanding holistically a problem. If there's, you know, a story angle that's that's touched you emotionally, running with that, but then using um, other sources to get a full 360 view of that emotion and what that sparked in you to make sure that it's not just emotion driving the story, but has really found other sources that can back that up or hold a more neutral opinion so that the story feels fulfilled and, and well-rounded as well. As, uh, as restrictions begin to slowly lift, how do you foresee balancing telling travel and culinary stories that inspire during a time when traveling, going out to eat, etc., remains uncertain. I know you guys touched a little bit on on uh, creating stories that inspire, but any 
any like specific examples that you guys could give as far as what kind of storytelling we could see that um, you know is a little bit more uplifting outside of just covering the crisis, especially as the economy start to reopen? Well, I mean, I do think sort of, I do think it will dominate all the stories sort of coming forward. But I think that, you know, there's a way of, um, and we talked about this sharing sort of the positive side of it. So I think, you know, as things ease, we're definitely going to move into telling other stories. But some you know, it is really inspiring to see the stories of how people are responding and doing things to positively impact their communities. And that's definitely some of the most inspiring things that I've seen. But I think in terms of travel photography, um, it's, I imagine that things are going to be quite local. So I imagine that publications will, and I've received emails from the publications that I shoot for sort of saying, where are you based? Because I sort of think that rather than me traveling to, um, you know, Europe, I like I would have done in the past, I imagine sort of the way that um, editors and, you know, people structure their publications will be that they look for sort of more uh, local based photographers and writers. And just to chime in there, um, you know, from Life and Times perspective, I think, uh, you know, you hit it on the nail easy as far as working with photographers and journalists and looking more like what makes sense to them locally. But then at the same time, we're focusing heavily on what can be done at home. And I think during this whole time, we've seen so much inspiration and, and, and interesting ideas come out of people cooking at home. And, you know, we're, we're blessed because we're in a community that, of home cooks that love to cook at home. And, you know, I know how to cook a few things and everybody here knows how to cook a few things, but there's a whole mass audience that this is like the first time that they're having to cook at home. And there's a little bit of catching up to do. And I think it's also very important to be creating content that is, is I don't want to say dummy proof, but it's easy and accessible for uh, a whole new audience to be cooking at home. And, you know, I think life and time really straddles that line between the food industry and then people that are outside of the food industry, whether it's creatives or other people in different industries. And I think having that balance is really important, um, especially at home. Mm. And I think, I, actually, sort of, sorry, just going back to sort of maybe a, a more succinct answer to that is I think a lot of stories will become, it'll be like what, discover your, uh, discover your local area, discover, you know, what's two hours down the road. Um, and I think that will be something really positive that comes out of it. I'm sure that people will get to know sort of their own country a lot better than they did before. Yeah, I agree. I agree. One, oh, sorry. Um, one way, one thing I was consuming, just listening to the home cooking podcast by Samin Nostrat was really nice because it was questions that were simple home cooking questions. And I've, you know, cooked for forever. So, but it was still really enjoyable and like the, the fun jokes and the, you know, conversations around that and idea sharing. Um, you know, it was obviously a podcast that was formed out of all of this, but it, and we know that, but it didn't need to dominate the whole show. So we got time for uh, uh, maybe just two more questions here. Here's one from David Marks. What is the difference to you between a good, genuine story and a piece that's essentially a glorified Yelp review? Uh, I guess I, I mean, it comes back to the, that there's a human aspect to it. You know, it's got to be not just, you know, one person's opinion about a certain food experience, but something that ha is intricately linked to an entire web of food that, you know, talks to thousands of years of food traditions or multiple different cultures or a specific place that's rooted in a terroir or it finds a specific ingredient that's made only by one person. There has to be an aspect to it that is both unique, but also universal. Anybody else want to chime in with that question? 
Or should we just go on for the next one? I think that was great. I wouldn't add kind of that same holistic view of what makes a good story. Yeah, great. Okay. I love this question. This is from Ilana Stone, who's also one of our correspondents in, uh, in South Africa. Uh, particularly for the writers, are you finding it challenging to keep pace or even a step ahead of the pandemics? So what are you working on now is still relevant when it goes to publication? This is tough for print specifically, but what do you think, Ziza and, and Elena? Um, it is hard. <laughs> I think there's a lot of emotions. Writers tend to be emotional as well. We connect with things and we want to share things and we want to you know, touch life in a way. And so when you're also living in this experience and handling your own emotions and your own you know, apathy at times or writer's block, I think that's where having a good team and, and editors that can also help you figure out like where's the longevity of this story. Does, you know, sometimes you just need those extra set of eyes to say, um, maybe try and take it in this direction or maybe go with this source because to be a self-contained vessel all the time is not sustainable. Um, yeah, that's, that's my thought. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I mean, as a writer, I don't like writing with a tight deadline. That's never been my sort of jam. I've been a food writer, so I generally have as much time as, you know, it's, it's an evergreen sort of story. Uh, and then, so now it's been a huge uh, adjustment for me working with really fast turnaround. Uh, and at the beginning, it was really hard because it seemed like I would write something and it would instantly be obsolete. Um, and so much so that I have a lot of things that I just, I, I scribbled down and then now we'll have nowhere to go. Um, but I think the situation is stabilizing a bit and I'm learning to adjust to sort of having a, a little bit of a longer lens. So you've focus on an event, but you also take into the context of the situation as it's developing. So it's a little bit less um, time sensitive. Yeah, in our life at time, we're, we're, we're really covering the, the crisis online and digitally because we could publish uh, as soon as possible. And we do also have a, a printed newspaper that comes out every quarter. So we're really looking at what stories are gonna be more relevant and more timeless for the paper that's specific for the paper. So I think ultimately you have to look at what's the medium and what's the timeline of that specific medium. Um, anything that's digital, podcast, or 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 uh, uh, written stories online, obviously you could publish those you know, as soon as possible, but they're gonna have less of a lifespan as things progress and change um, as is the case right now, where the story and the narrative keeps changing every every week. Um, one last question here. I want to I want to end on the on something that's hopeful and get some ideas of of what you all are doing. Um, from Natalie Kane, in this unknown time, what practices or ways do you talk yourself off the ledge of your emotions, sheltering at home? So let's any yoga, any, let's give some uh, motivation here, some inspiration, what we could do to uh, stay sane during this time. Well, I um, make a lot of pastry. That seems to be the thing that is pretty therapeutic for me. I really like, you know, kneading the dough. Um, and I've also discovered Schitt's Creek. And I think I'm about, you know, five years behind. But I just love it. It just lifts me up and I watch, you know, I just can't stop watching it. I've ma I think I'm I'm starting series five. I've got two series left and I'm just, yeah, I just love it. So basically it's I'm just eating a lot of tart and eating and watching a lot of TV. So that's getting me through it. For me, I've been making a lot of just like experimenting with pasta doughs. And so um sharing that with friends and sauces. And for me, it's always, it's like pasta all the time. Like at pasta every meal, how can I incorporate different pastas? Um, so that's been really nice. Pasta. I'll send you some good recipes. I made like three different shows <laughs> yesterday, which happened accidentally. Um, uh, but what I would agree, it can like consuming things that are, are lighthearted and fun. Um, I really have been enjoying lately, like, Tabitha Brown on Instagram, Leslie Jordan on Instagram, which are just kind of like so silly and fun. Um, but also like also riding my bike has been really, really great. Um, 
and trying to like for me I don't enjoy running or, or working out necessarily but I like being active and so um those things for me have been helpful yeah, and I definitely have been passing the time with a lot of uh, kitchen experimentation too, lots of fermentation. I've been getting into the, I'm all on the sourdough starter train and the fermenting my ginger beer and making kraut and pickles and all those kinds of things, along with lots of pastry too. Um, and I think, you know, like, like Allison was saying, getting outside, like getting some exercise. I take a lot of long walks. Luckily, I'm, I'm able to take walks here. Um, and when I do that, I listen to On Being, a podcast by Krista Tippett, which I cannot recommend highly enough because it is very spiritual and it will certainly put you at peace. Um, yeah. Yeah, literally all those pasta <laughs> podcasts outside. And the only thing I would add would be I, I really like history. And so reading history books or even just watching a documentary and remembering that humanity is strong and we survive and we'll get through this as simple as it sounds that we're all survivors of great lineages in our in our own ways and yeah we can do it and dogs oh yes. thank god dog. for dogs right now <laughs> that's what's getting me through this pandemic is my dog the yeah. 10 year old shih tzu um all right everybody thank you so much for attending our webinar and i want to uh, uh extend my thanks to our panelists and uh, uh and ziza our wonderful moderator um, we have another webinar coming up on Friday, which we're going to be promoting very soon um, on reopening, restaurants that are reopening and what the future of dining might look like. So we're really excited about um, what that looks like. And then next week, we have another webinar focused on something that's a little bit more divisive and, 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 uh, and, and tricky, which is um, undocumented workers in the restaurant industry. and, and how they've essentially become essential workers during this pandemic. So we're gonna have uh, uh, an amazing conversation with a few folks um, about how undocumented workers are uh, faring during this pandemic in the restaurant industry. But again, thank you so much for tuning in. And if you're a Life in Time member, thank you so much. You make our work possible. Um, and if you love our work and you're not a member, feel free to subscribe and just go head over to lifeintime.com. Um, these webinars are completely free, so it's free education for anybody who wants to uh, tune in. This will also be available uh, later for everybody else to watch that wasn't able to tune in. Um, and yeah, thank you so much and stay safe out there.